How can we solve translation problems? This is my very simple question, and I'm going to give you some categories, and then you'll do an exercise. You are going to solve some translation problems. Firstly, I'll situate translation for you. When two people meet, and they have different languages, and they have a common purpose of some kind, I don't know, they're going to fall in love, or buy and sell something, or sign a peace agreement, or agree to fight each other. I don't care what they're going to do. How can they communicate? Gestures and grimaces, as we have the first contacts of Europeans in Australia, or Spanish Europeans in South America. One can learn the other's language, or both, as tends to happen. You can develop passive competence. We could have a conversation, you speak German, I speak English, I'll understand you enough for a conversation. That's intercomprehension. Okay? You can do a lot of things. And if you can't do any of the above, you can get somebody to help you. A mediator, Sprachmittler. Okay, be it written or spoken. Now, translation, therefore, is one of the ways of solving a communication problem where languages are not shared. Only one of them. It is the most expensive of those options. Huh? We are expensive. We should be expensive. We're a luxurious product, a luxury product. Okay? And... It makes sense that if this contact situation extends over a long period, you fall in love and get married, do not keep a mediator hanging around. Okay? You will find it more economical to learn the language, or somebody learns your language, or you get a lingua franca. Okay? Translation here, translation and interpreting, are expensive and for short-term contacts. It's an economic, it's simple, right? That's where we're going to get employment. If not, then not. It's interesting that the European Union, as a political project, pretends to be a long-term project based on mediation. Think about it. Sort of marriages that don't work. Now, translation so defined or so located implies three things in order to be recognized as a translation in our culture here and now. There's a crossing of languages. There are two languages involved. The length that we produce depends on the length of what comes in. Okay, so there are two texts. And if this start text is longer, then we expect the target text to be longer. Okay, you can't, a translation is not a summary, it's not a commentary, it's not an essay on. It has a length relationship. Not exact length, but a length relationship with the start text. You can call it start text or source text. I'm calling it start text because it's like Ausgangstext, right? And the person who says I is not the author. Oh, that's hard. If I say I'm really tired, you could believe I'm really tired because I've been working today. Or I could be an interpreter who is telling you that the speaker is really tired and this I that I say doesn't belong to me, it belongs to the speaker over there. Okay? So in translation and interpreting, you have what's called the alien I. The I is not me, it's somebody else. And that distinguishes uh, translation from a commentary, for example, or a report. <coughs> You could get a translator to do commentaries and reports, but uh, technically the translation form that we have today with us here is defined by these three things. I th do you agree? Those three things come together. That's what we do. That's our product. This doesn't apply in all cultures. Before the Renaissance, it wouldn't apply either. I can find plenty of texts that are produced by translators, 12th, 13th century, where the I belongs to the translator. Uh, 
So there's relatively new form historically, uh, and there are many cultures which simply have constant re-narration um, of past events or of history, of texts, uh, without the alien eye being used. Now, <clears throat> the dominant way of thinking about translation um, since the 1950s in the European Western tradition has been uh, based on equivalence. Equivalence is not saying just that lion is Löwe, to take an example from Otto Kada. It's not just formal, they look the same, so therefore they're the same. It has all, well, since the 1960s, it has had a meaning of adjusting so that an equivalent relation can be um, established. Freitag der 13, 13. Yeah, is what kind of day for you in German, in, in Austria? A good day or a bad day? Watch out. Yeah, bad luck day. Don't walk under ladders, don't give a lecture, don't take a plane. Yeah. Into Spanish, this is useful for some of you who go on holidays to beaches, get drunk, don't do it. On Martes y Trece, Martes Trece is Tuesday the 13th. Tuesday is the bad luck day in Spain. Okay? So, Friday the 13th, leave Austria, go to Spain. You'll be safe. It's practical intercultural competence. So, if we have to translate Friday the 13th, Freitag der 13th, into Spanish, do we put Martes 13 or Viernes 13, which is Friday? Ah, simple problem. And the answer is, yes, you're right, it depends. It depends on what? It depends on the value you're trying to communicate. Is it the date or the fact of being bad luck? Is it the formal equivalence or the communicative function? Is it the film, Friday the 13th? I, I asked my Chinese students, so Chinese, Korean, Japanese, you know, do you have Friday the 13th in your culture? Yes, they all have it. I said, why is Friday the 13th bad luck in your culture? The film, the film, there was a film, a series of films, Friday the 13th. Okay, um, equivalence just simply says that uh, if you need the function, then you use mart uh, well, martes, you use Tuesday. If you need the formal equivalence that looks like um, the date, then you use Friday. And both of those will be correct, will, will be equivalent, depending on the requirements of the translation situation. Very basic theory, okay? Equivalence is thinking this way. If it's bad luck day on the start side, it's got to equal bad luck day on the target side. As you can see, I have somebody, sorry it's writing, think about speaking as well, something to somebody. Unfortunately though, oh, you, you see I changed the people there. Um, if the audience is different, I'm translating for people in Spain, so uh, then the equivalence relation doesn't work anymore if I say Friday, Viernes, and so I have to change the text. I've made it bigger, but it could be just mean I could just put in Martes, Tuesday, or I could put in an explanation or a footnote or other things. And if you can't change the text, then what you change is the audience, the people who are going to get your information. Okay? So the equivalence paradigm or mode of thought says be prepared to change things. If you don't change the text, you're going to change the audience. Okay. And um, it assumes that the same function is possible between those two sides. The thought of equivalence, very simple theory as expressed here, never occurred to anyone prior to the Renaissance. It's, it's a modern theory in that sense. Why in the Middle Ages languages didn't have the same value you had some languages closer to God, inspiration, other languages weren't. Uh, therefore, translation usually went down from the 
better languages to the poorer languages to enrich them, and there was no need for equivalence because you were moving something into a language which didn't have the means of expression. Completely different mode of thought. Okay. The two options available to translators in the equivalence paradigm, not that Schleiermacher ever worked on equivalence as such, um, are expressed there. It's a very simple classical theory. Either you move the reader to the author or the author to the reader. And those two options map on to some of the base, most basic claims of equivalence, formal equivalence uh, in Eugene Nida's term, formal correspondence, and dynamic equivalence. This means you're either changing the reader or changing the text, as I put it in the diagram. Okay? I'll make this simple for you. You haven't heard of, of television. You're too busy working learning languages to watch stupid television shows like The Price is Right. You ever heard of that? Their Price is Heiss. In German, I believe. It's, where, it's, it's training in basic consumer capitalism. Here is an object. Guess its price. Right? And people have to guess, and they get closer to it. And if you get your price is right. Yep. In French, it's le prix juste. I don't know why it couldn't be le juste prix, but le prix juste, the, the correct one. El precio justo in Spanish, the correct price. That's okay. And what a wonderful thing you guys do in German. <laughs> in German, it's hot. Why? Why is right now hot? Huh? Heiß, warum? The rhyme. Yeah. The price is right. The price is heiß. It's translating the right. It's like poetry. It's even smarter than that. Because if I understand correctly, at least when I was a kid, and I have, when I play with my children, yeah, used to, uh, they're guessing where something is. And you say, oh, no, no, cold, 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 hot, 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 you're getting close, boiling hot, boiling hot, yes, you got it. Do you play that game? Yeah. You didn't have a deprived childhood, you're good? Okay. <laughs> That's exactly what they're doing in the game. So, you know, what a wonderful bit of translation. That should be signed by the translator. The place is tight. Uh, not translating the word right, translating the rhyme, and capturing the function of the, of the game. Beautiful piece of work. Should be praised by translators all over the world. So much for the equivalence paradigm. Um, oh, well. Who wants to be a millionaire? Have you heard of that one? What is it in German? Good. Now, this started in Britain when they had pounds. Okay. So, um, a pound is worth more than a euro. So it should really be, who wants to earn 1,433,000? The euro's going down very quick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, an exact translation. Yeah, who wants to win 1,433,000? No, 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 no. Not very catchy. Okay. So all languages keep something like millionaire there. There, again, millionaire is not doesn't refer to a quantity, it refers to the idea of a lot of money, and that's enough to translate that. Okay, so equivalence could handle all those quite interesting problems. It gets a little more difficult um, when you get to the Bible. This is an example from Eugene Nida, an American Bible translation theorist. Passed away a few years ago, much missed. Uh, in Corinthians and elsewhere in the Bible, um, people, or, or Paul is telling them to, that they should greet each other with a holy kiss. I don't know. You go to church, you guys? You, do you give each other a kiss at the end of the... <laughs> Not done these days. Um, the Luther Bible does the same thing, which is interesting. Okay, The, the, the Luther that's updated all the time, right? But um, Nida suggested that, that um, dynamic equivalence to get across the, the function and not the actual word, um, 
We should give each other a hearty handshake, which is what happened the last time I went to church. At the end, we all had to shake everybody's hand. Do you do that, or is it a... Do you, do you, it happens? Okay. We don't kiss each other. <laughs> different cultures, different presuppositions, and the adequate translation says, neither, is that a kiss should become a handshake because that's what we do. Okay? Uh, that he called dynamic equivalence. You translate the function. And this is what we do. He's more worried about these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some people take the Bible too literally, I think. <laughs> That's horrible. I get rid of that. So. Okay. Anything's possible. In culture, anything's possible. Don't, don't let anybody tell you 100% we don't kiss each other. You know. it, it can go on. Now, all those ideas about the way translators can adjust text as necessary traditionally come in terms of this or the other. You've seen that in Schleiermacher, it's also in, in Eugene Nider. Um, there's a Schleiermacher's term, it, the translation can be uh, einbürgend or the verdeutschen, I think, or verfremdet, foreignizing or domesticating. Oh, domesticating, usually say. Eugene Nider talked about formal uh, correspondence and dynamic equivalence. Others, uh, Koller, transferend, adaptierend. Uh, Levy, Czech theorist, talked about a translation that pretends not to be a translation, that reads so fluently in terms of the target culture norms that it is illusory, opposed to uh, anti-illusory translations. Juliana Haus, a German theorist of Hamburg, talks about overt versus covert. A covert translation is one that hides its translational status. Sounds so fluent and natural which may not be a good thing. Christiana uh, Nott, documental, or actually documentary and instrumental. Okay, Some translations tell you about the previous text, they are documents, and others are instruments in themselves. They do things in the world without referring back to the previous text. Uh, and Lawrence Venuti talks about transparent translations, which he thinks are bad, because they hide the otherness of other cultures, versus resistant translations, which uh, show that otherness by being difficult to read. And he thinks those are good. Okay, I'm just pointing out all these people have said all these smart things. Somebody said, why so many theories? Somebody wrote that. Why do I have to learn? You don't have to learn any of that. Go, go on. You don't have to learn this, okay? I just want to show you that in uh, the Russian or Soviet tradition, there has been a development of a meta-language. A meta-language is this language about language, terms to describe what translators do. And we can go back, you can go back earlier, but here we're starting in 1920, when you get talk about adequacy in terms of equivalence. A 34 equivalence is distinguished between, uh, from substitution and here, equivalence means the same thing. It would be uh, Friday the 13th, viernes y trece, okay? That would be equivalence. And substitution would be martes y trece, all right? And then we go Retzka, Fedorov, Retzka again, Bakudorov, but it goes on. Uh, Vine Dabone, 1958, low into Chinese in 1958. And you get lists of many more things that people can do. Okay, they're not stuck at two. It started off at two with a very restrictive notion of equivalence, but the meaning of equivalence changed in Russian, in, in, in the English in the 1960s, in Russian about 1974, and uh, equivalence came to mean all these different ways of maintaining equivalence. Prior to that, it meant just formal similitude. Okay. Uh, it's been done for quite a few languages as well. As I think I mentioned, uh, for the past year I've been looking at all these typologies. This is another one comparing them, showing that they don't map onto each other. Uh, Vinay Dablene, comparing French and English, Vasquez Ayora, Spanish and English, and Malone uh, looking at 
German, English. Okay, the categories don't don't line up. You don't have to learn any of that. The one that interests me a lot is by Michael Schreiber in uh, Germersheim, uh, who has done a lot of work on this, and he uh, actually suggests that all the things we can do, I'm calling them translation solutions, they are verfahrensarten, verfahren in German, um, can be put under three heads, which he calls translationsmethode. One first method for him is text translation. You translate for the text. You translate what's there. If it says, uh, you know, the, the, the text we did last week, you know, that uh, naturally speaking one, you know, whatever it's got there, you put in your text. If it says Canada, put Canada. If it says create reports twice, put it twice. That's what's in the text. Umfeldübersetzung is translating for the context. We're going beyond what's just in the text, and we can adjust it. Okay, We can make it sound better. We can delete the create reports because our function here is to sell a product. So we make more changes at this level or at this method. And then he has something he calls interlingual bearbeitung, which I take as adaptation editing, when you actually change the content. For example, I think if we changed, we threw out Canada and put international for the text we did last week, yeah, that's getting on to editing. That, that's doing more than would be in the traditional concept of translation such as we have it on the first two levels. But uh, Schreiber makes the point that translators can do all three things, can work on all these levels. Even though our concept of translation usually does not yet include the Arbeitung, changing the content, it's things, it's people do it. Translators get paid for doing it, so let's recognize that it's there. Here we have broken beyond the binarism. It's becoming not just look at that side or that side. It's saying solve problems by looking at that or that or that. The frame of decision making gets wider. One of the interests of this kind of uh, meta language is that Text translation can be done quite well by machines, increasingly well by machine translation. But not the others, not yet. Okay, There's a human component necessarily at the higher levels of decision making. I'm going to propose another typology. Uh, Schreiber's typology is on Moodle. If you're interested in it, I think they are very good terms. It's in German. You can look at them, consult them, use those terms, with, all, with my blessing. All right? uh, Schreiber is looking at German with other languages. I've been looking at more languages, and so I, I have my own typology, which I think is simpler, and I think it works for a lot more languages. So I'm going to present it to you, and you're going to tell me how bad it is. I, I, this is the third time I present it. I get feedback, I fix it up, I present it, I get feedback. I don't know if it's getting better. Okay. I'm not concerned with everything you do. You're translating along. It says Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You're right, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. One, two, three, it's okay. You do the syntactic change, that's fine. You use a bit of a dictionary, that's good. You're translating in cruise mode, you're going fast. All right, no problem. You can do that because you know languages, right? And then, boof, bump, turbulence, airplane, boof, problem, warning, something's happening. You get create reports twice, help, what do I do with this? There's no space between naturally speaking. Um, what was the other one? Is it the formal or informal? No. Problems for which there's no easy answer. There's not one or the other, or right or wrong. It's, hey, I've got to think about this text. I've got to do something. Do something that the machine can't do. 
Those are the ones I'm interested in. And I think there are three things you can do. You can copy what's there, one way or another. You can change the expression. That's what Martes y Trete and Black, and Black Friday... Uh, yeah. um, you can change the expression or you can change the content. And uh, the Bearbeitung that Schreiber has is in the content change. A lot of the... Um, the uh, was it? Um, Umfeldübersetzung is in there. Okay, you've got to do something. What can you do? Copy what's there, change the expression, or change the content. Very simple theory. Don't accuse me of being abstruse or difficult. Well, not yet. Here we go. What can you copy? You can copy the sound of the foreign word. For example, Fußball, of Spanish, heißt Football, because that's what it sounds like in English. And you go to Brazil and watch them play in teams, and the team is a team. <laughs> okay. So, lots of words are created uh, at the front line by translators, but then by terminologists, by copying sounds, and it happens. You can copy the morphology. When football entered Spain from English... It was, it was uh, British sailors in, in the port of Bilbao who were playing football and they brought it in. Uh, so all the terminology was in English. People in Spain thought, no, we can't say football because that's English. And so they st invented the term ballon pie. Ballon is a ball and pie is your foot. Okay? And that exists in Spanish along with football. Ballon pie, copying the morphology. Uh, the other example, uh, sky skyscrapers into many languages. German? What's a skyscraper? Yeah, you see, it's literally Vulcan. So that's even creative. It's, it's, you have clouds in Germany, you see. In America, they didn't have clouds, so it had to be the sky. Okay. Yeah, Spanish, rascacielos, uh, scratching the sky. Yeah. Um, okay, so... In the 50s, 60s, terms, terms sort of travel that way. You can copy the script. People going into Cyrillic or Ch uh, Russian might have kept the brand name in the English script. People going into uh, Chinese tend to do that. So the script can be copied. I have an example there. Go to McDonald's. You can be in Arabic or you can be in English. Makes no difference. Same sign, one sign, two languages. Okay. <coughs> The interest of this is that machine translation tends not to copy the foreign words except when they don't know them. You know, when it draws a blank, it'll copy it. But people writing between cultures often use foreign words. Translators tend not to because we think we have to put everything, translate everything. But um, I, I, I was watching um, or following sports commentators. I like football, I'm sorry. Barcelona, 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 FC Barcelona. Okay. Uh, and I'm watching these British commentators. They use tons of Spanish words in their commentary. They're speaking English, but they like to give it all this local color. Copying is something that translators have done. It's something that we forget about because we think we have to translate everything. Uh, but it's something that we can get paid to do. You can copy, that's funny, isn't it? Um, you can copy prosodics, like when you translate a rhyme, you're copying the rhyme scheme, not the actual word. Fixed phrases, uh, I just invented this one, like a dog in a game of Skittles, that doesn't exist in English, I invented it, I brought it into the language just now. Uh, and text structure, sonnet, blank verse, you know, literary forms that travel, um, the form of an abstract in a scientific article has traveled, and in fact it's been shown that German uh, academic articles written in German are becoming increasingly like academic articles written in English, that, that through translation you're copying the forms. Ah, this is copying structure again. Uh, this is actually from Walter Benjamin, because I'm Supposed to be Walter Benjamin Professor here at the moment. 
and he translated to Baudelaire, uh, and this is from his translation. Uh, the French means uh, like a worm that takes away from humanity what humanity is, that takes away the food of humanity. Okay? Uh, the German somehow has daily bread at the end. Why did Brot get in there when it's not in the French? And the simple answer is, it rhymes. Not very well either. But <laughs> okay, uh, so he, he wanted the rhyme, he, he worked for the rhyme, and that's what you get. Um, I, I put it in because Walter Benjamin wrote a very, well, probably the most commented on essay on translation. And at one point, he waxes lyrical about Brot. He says, you know, German bread is translated by the French pan. But the two are not the same. They never will be. You know, and you think light bread, a baguette in France, and then heavy German serious brot. Yeah, yeah, not the same. It's, oh, it's true. They are so different. How could bread ever be translated as bread? What an engaño. What a deception. Oh, I was just so pleased to find him using bread so gratuitously there just for a rhyme. He was, at the end, just another bad translator like most of us. Okay. After copying, things get interesting. You're no longer copying. Now you're going to change things. Have I made a mistake? No. And I propose there are two things you can change. If you're looking at an object, okay, back. I can look at it from this direction or from that direction, or from the other direction. I'm changing the perspective. I'm seeing the same thing from another point of view. All right? Perspective change. This is an example taken from uh, Schreiber. It's Italian. Il professore esse muovi dall'idea. means he starts out from the idea that. Okay? And in German, geht uh, davon aus. All right, so um, the idea has disappeared. Okay, you're just seeing the, the idea. It's not that the professor starts from the idea, it's that the professor starts and goes towards the idea implicitly. Well, the idea is not named because it's, it's what's going to come. Uh, another one from English his failure to feel excitement about becomes Evagani Shaf Darat. He wasn't very keen on it. Okay, what is a failure uh, becomes a, no. It's, yeah, I guess it is there. His failure to feel yeah, the, the failure has disappeared, and the quality of not being keen on uh, is what um, what comes out. Okay, hmm. they're not very clear examples, are they? This one is though. In, in, in French, a hotel is complete, full, and in English, it's no vacancies. Same thing. One looks at how full it is, the other at how empty it is. Okay. In German, what's that like? A hotel is full? Ausgebucht. Booked. Looked out. Okay. So, it's, it's, it, again, looking at it from a different direction. I guess it's more like no vacancies, yeah? No, Ausgebucht. Yeah, perfect. All booked. Yeah. Okay, so often when you're stuck on a translation problem, try to imagine it the other way around. And a very good basic trick is if you can't do it in the positive, negate the negative. All right? Uh, shallow. Swimming pools have a deep end and a shallow end. Okay? In German, tief und dann. You do have a word. French, profond, peu profond. <laughs> profondo, poco profondo. <laughs> Italian? Same. Who, who are my Italian speakers? You've disappeared. I'm being discreet. Okay. All right. Um, sometimes you're missing a word and, and the solution will come by negating the negation. Okay? Um, can we?
That, that's just changing the perspective. I think changing a voice as well. Uh, we noticed last week that the English could go into C or to. Uh, that would be changing the perspective as well, changing the voice with which a, a text is expressed. Perspective is one thing, though. You can also come closer to an object or further away. And that changes the granularity of it. It changes the density of how much information is packed in that bit of language. Okay? So I'm looking at density change in that sense. Of moving forward, moving away. The other one is perspective, moving around. Uh, for example... When we go last week from Canada to internationally, we're generalizing, we're moving out. We're changing the density of it. But it's clearer here in things like this. Uh, Gemeinde is hard to translate. It's an administrative unit that doesn't exist in English. But we could translate it as German unit of local government. What are we doing? We're paraphrasing, we're spreading it out, we're reducing the density. My solution. Classic example, Eton. An expensive school in England. If the culture, the receiving culture, doesn't know what Eton means, we can say, oh, the exclusive private school, Eton. Okay, and we add that information. What are we doing? We're reducing the density. You can do a couple of things at the same time. This is from Peter Newmark. He suggests copy Gemeinde and then in brackets explain what it is. Okay, so you, you can, all these solutions, you can use them, you can pile them up, multiple translations. Uh, more provocatively, I think, changing density also includes resegmentation. Uh, this is important for me because I work from Spanish into English and Spanish loves long sentences. And going to England, I just get a big pair of scissors and that's one, that's one, that's one. Okay. What am I doing? I'm making it so that the bit of length the reader has to process to get an idea is shorter. Okay. I'm reducing syntactic density. I'm reducing the numbers of subordination. Uh, in some cultures, it's necessary to have a longer sentence, so you can join them up. You're allowed to do that, and sometimes it's necessary to do that. It is necessary to do that. Compensation. Compensation is when you get the value, you can't solve it there, you solve it on a different level or somewhere else in the text. Okay? Vine d'abonne, also to twelve. Shall we use the tu form? Tu form in French. Shall we go from formal to intimate? Uh, that doesn't exist in the United States. So they suggest, just call me Bill. Okay, not Mr. Smith. It's a nice example. But you can also find a new place of expression. You can use notes. You can use a glossary. You can use prefaces. You can use images of the front cover of books. Unless you are an interpreter, in which case you're stuck. You, know, you have to do some, you haven't got all these things that you can draw on. Mind you, when I was interpreting uh, medical conferences, sometimes it gets so complex that my favorite expression was, as you can see on the screen, uh, because all the specialists knew the terminology. It was all on the screen. Uh, I, I, sometimes, you know, you're going to make a mistake. I would just say, as is fully explained on the screen, pass it on. Compensation. Over there. It's done there. Cultural co correspondence. The expression, like a bull in a china shop. China is porcelain. A bull comes in, rushes around, smashes everything. Okay? Comes in like a bull in a china shop. Smashes. In French, it's like a dog in a game of Skittles. In German? Oh, wait a minute, I found it. Ein Elefant. That's good, eh? 
It's a bull in English, a dog in French, and an elephant in German. But much the same effect, I think, okay? These are the cultural correspondences that good translators and interpreters tend to come out with all the time. And then culture specific terms, street food, cahier, strasse, whiskey, vodka. I don't know if whiskey is the equivalent of vodka or sake, but I have to do more research on that, I think, in order to figure out the cultural. I do remember working alongside an interpreter for Spanish English. Spanish has lots of proverbs, okay, lots of these expressions, and some speakers just love them, using them all the time. And this guy had everything. It all came out what, you know, without even batting an eyelid expression. Uh, I sit back and look, oh, oh chapeau. It's, yeah. And then I had to do the same speaker, and I couldn't. But I used other strategies. Either you give the meaning, or, uh, as is said in the famous Spanish proverb, meaning, such and such, and you gloss it, and you manage to get some communication going. Uh, if you can use these culturally corresponding expressions, that's great. If you can't, there are alternatives available. And then the uh, Arbeitung, or what I'm calling change in content, translations can correct, often have to. Do not expect your start text to be well written. The well written start text is a literary luxury in today's world. In some cultures, you have to exert censorship. In most cultures, there are some extreme... I, I've had problems. Never get the time. No, I, I, I was once uh, working on a children's dictionary going from English into Spanish. Children, 12 to, 12 to 15 years old, adolescents. Um, and it was sold because of the pictures. In Spain, they do really good artwork. The text is rubbish but the, the American editors sort of changed that anyway. So it didn't matter what I... Well, it did matter. And I, I was in charge of the project. I checked the text, but I missed some. And one of them that I missed had this sentence, El hombre blanco ha marcado el progreso de la humanidad en dos, durante dos mil años. The white man has marked the progress of humanity for 2,000 years. Whew. And that was translated tal qual, as it comes, and, and sent over to the publisher, who rejected the whole thing for this, and it came back to me to, um, to deal with it. Okay, uh, we should have censored it. I knew, I mean, I know that in the United States you can't talk about it. It's sexist and racist, all in two words. I mean, how bad you can you get? And then the commentary came back saying, not only is it sexist, but it's racist and historically inaccurate, because in China, they invented gunpowder and pasta and paper and the, the printing press well before the West. Then I had a, an exchange of letters between the editor in the United States, who turned out to be Chinese, that's yeah, and the author, who turned out to be a proto-fascist, arguing about the grandeur. The author wrote back and said, I don't care about pasta and paper and whatever else. Nothing compares with the beauties of Gothic cathedrals. <laughs> That's the first time in my life that I refused to translate. I remember getting this letter about, about whether Chinese culture is better than Western culture and saying, I cannot translate this ethically because no good is going to come of this conversation. I mean, these guys can have the conversation, but neither of them is going to change. And... I'm just going to cross this article, take it out of the encyclopedia, which is what I did. Okay? Sometimes the best strategy for translators is not to translate. And in that particular circumstance, I think I was right. If I continued to translate, I would have had more of this rubbish. Okay, so censorship, why not? Updating. Schreiber gives a wonderful case of updating. It's from French into German, and it's about bicycle regulations. And the law says of 1985 you need two reflectors, and he translated it. The 1992 law says you need four reflectors. 
So he, he, he improved it, he changed it, he updated it. Okay. Translators can and do omit things occasionally. If it's major, then it's usually declared under another name that is you know, edited by. And additional content can be given in footnotes, in prefaces, and in afterwards. Why not? So much for it. That's my typology of translation solutions. You can see there are three things you can do. There are seven, I think, major categories, and then an infinite number of actual solutions that can be used. You know, those three dots means go on and discover for yourself. The important point is it's not binary. It's not that or that. There is a certain binarism in the nature of translation because there are two languages, two communication partners. But the things we're good at are supposed to be these things here.